Okay, um, I'll be talking, this is a, a talk which I can give in virtually any country in the world by changing the data to some extent, but I want to start with uh, the Australian data first off, because uh, I'm talking, the, the title of my latest book is Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? I was supposed to bring some with me, but I can't do everything, so I didn't. Um, but that basically is saying what caused the financial crisis in the night 2008, now we're going to face another one. But I thought I'd start with a prelude because part of why I've got the attitude after economics comes from my own personal experiences. I went to university at Sydney University doing an arts law degree between 1971 and 75. And at, uh, my whole focus was on getting an education. I remember being challenged my father at some stage about not getting results that he thought was good enough. And I said, I'm not there to get a job, I'm there to get an education. Uh, these days, <laughs> he's be rather pleased about the education, the, where my job has led to, courtesy of education I got. But a major factor that occurred in, during, while the time I was at university was a huge increase in unemployment. So when I began university, the unemployment rate was over the order of 1.5%. Now, most people don't realise anymore that that was the case. You've got to have a fair share of grey hair here to actually know that was the situation. And what we take now as the normal is an unemployment rate somewhere around about 5%. But this is Australia's unemployment record uh, from 1945 until now. Now, you notice everything went awry in 1974, 74, 75. Gigantic increase in unemployment. For the, pre the previous period, all, you know, it was absolute crisis levels and unemployment rate was almost 4%. And uh, if you go back to when the Menzies government almost lost because of, you know, and Menzies government only survived the 1961 election because of a leakage of preferences from the Communist Party. <laughs> Are you aware of that? Okay. Otherwise, there would have been a Labor government in 1961. Uh, but everything's going along hunky dory, and we, we look like we'd, we'd, uh, we might even say we've reached what you might call the great moderation, to use kind of popular phrase, between 65 and 74. And that was when I was, for me, between the ages of uh, about, you know, what? 12 and, and 12 and, uh, and 21. And then bang, this explosion occurred and this has been the new normal ever since. Now, what I was conscious of at the time, because I, I, helped, I led the political economy dispute at Sydney University back in 1973. So I was doing a fair bit of reading about economics and keeping an eye on the, on the skyline as well, because at that stage, Sydney's skyline was full of cranes in the same sort of way that things are happening in Melbourne now. And then they all disappeared in 74. And what actually happened, uh, and, and I was conscious of it at the time, but it's become the focus of my economics ever since, is there was an enormous credit bubble. The blue line is the change, annual change in private debt. Now, it had been running along at no more, let's graph on the right-hand side here, no more than about 6%, maximum of about 9 all the way through from 55 to 65 Then it exploded in 1972-73, huge boom and then it slowed down. It didn't go negative. And I'll explain later, it doesn't have to go negative to cause a crisis. But that experience is what caused the boom and bust that was blamed on the Whitlam government. And I've seen this ever since. The dynamics of credit explain virtually 90% of what happens in politics. What happens to people's understanding of politics, they blame it on their party in power. Now, I'm actually rather looking forward, I hope, that Malcolm Turnbull is still Prime Minister when this one bursts, it's the Newman University. And if anybody deserves it, well, actually Tony deserves it more, but Malcolm is my second preference. Option, you know the optional preferential voting? Who would I like to be in charge when the crisis hits? First option would be Tony, second would be Malcolm. But anyway, uh, hopefully they are, because the same basic dynamic that went on back there is happening, happening again massively under Keating. You see that this blue line when it goes below that dotted line that the arrow is on right now, that's when credit is negative, when the change of private debt is actually negative, so people are actually reducing their debt. And I'll explain what that actually means. It's subtracting from demand rather than adding to it. We didn't have the crisis back under Rudd because the, when one of my favourite government policy, which is what I call the first home vendors boost, giving more money to first home buyers so they can hand over ten times as much would leave it money to household sellers, that reverse the trend for declining credit, otherwise it would have gone through and we would have had a recession as severe as the 1990s recession under Keating. But they managed to avoid it and we thought there's no problem with Australia. Well, I'll show you what the problem is, what we've accumulated for ourselves later. But of course the crisis was something economists made very clear warnings about. 
They told us it was going to, 2008 was going to be a fabulous year. This is the OECD. This is the sort of advice. Bear in mind, politicians like, like Abbott and Costello, pardon me, like Abbott and uh, Turnbull, um, they take, they don't, they, they've only done first year economics if you're lucky, third year economics if you're unlucky, uh, if they believe this stuff. But they rely upon what they get told by the OECD and all these bodies. So the OECD is saying in June of 2007, next year is going to be fabulous. Get ready to take credit for a great year which of course the politicians would have been doing. And they got blasted by the press when it all falls apart. Uh, this is, this, they're saying the forecast is benign. Now, sustained growth, falling unemployment. That's what they were telling politicians they're going to experience in 2008. And to a large extent, you can't blame politicians for falling for this stuff. Because you can't expect, given the fact that we have, our elections are based on popularity contacts with people with serious cases of narcissistic personality disorder, there's no guarantee they actually understand what they're doing for evidence I give you America at the moment. <laughs> we don't select them on the basis of what they understand. We select them on the basis of their rampant desire to be popular. And of course, they're going to rely upon what they think are the experts. Now, in most cases, like for example, if you want to build a telecommunications system, you rely upon the experts telling you what you should build, don't you? You don't go out and tell the engineers that you shouldn't have cable to the house. You accept their advice, that's the best system. Okay. Um, but with economists, they do accept their advice and they thought falling unemployment's all going to come our way. Now, four months after, the crisis is actually regarded as having started in August 2007. The reason that date is chosen is that one of the most significant events letting us know that there's a tsunami coming rather than the usual garden variety economic recession was the decision by the Banque Nationale de Paris to shut down three of its funds that were exposed to the American subprime market because they said there was no possible way of valuing the assets. They'd realised they were, you know, they'd been sold cactus by the, uh, the banks they'd bought them off, so they shut their funds down, didn't allow a dump redemption. That was a very big shock. August 9 of 2007. This is four months later. This is the Federal Open Monetary Committee, the, board of the, 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 the body within the Federal Reserve that sets interest rates. And this is the forecast given to them by their chief economist. He's now still earning a very good living as a consultant, working for, uh, for a major consulting firm in the States. A forecast again, benign picture. Despite all the financial turmoil, the economy avoids recession. Uh, that was, then that we now regard December 2007 as the month in which the formal recession began. Okay? So the, at the time it began, he was telling us there's going to be no recession. So how do they miss the biggest economic event since the Great Depression? Now, their excuse is that it's a random shock. You, know, you can't predict the roll of the dice, that sort of thing. Well, what the real reason, I'll explain in, in detail now, is we're living in the biggest private debt bubble in the history of capitalism. And it's all happened under the watch of mainstream economists. And to give you an idea of the scale, I have data for Australia, but I don't have it in this particular database I'm using right now. The red line is the ratio of private debt to GDP in America from 1834 to today. And that's partly a synthetic data series. I had to tap together three data series and make sure the overlaps were correct and get work backwards from the current definition to the modern definition. The blue one I actually find more intriguing. That's the level of private debt in the UK. And this is actually Bank of England data, unprocessed. And what you find is the level of private debt in the UK never exceeded 75% of GDP from 1880 all the way through to 1980. A certain person was elected then. Remember her name? Okay. Shortly afterwards, under her and Blair, the level of private debt rose to about 195% of GDP. Now, it's since come down a bit. You can see in the final section there, America, which is the red line, has delivered a bit. The UK, which is the blue line, has delivered a bit. And guess who the black line is? That's why we avoided the crisis back in 2008. We borrowed our way out of it both households and, and uh, firms doing it. Now, the reason economists miss this is they don't believe credit matters and they believe the economy is always in equilibrium. And this is why I think sometimes you should tell people they're wrong. Okay? Uh, because here is Paul Krugman, Nobel Prize winner, having a go at Richard Koo, who was an analyst for uh, a, Japanese, a Japanese firm, who said there's a balance sheet, this, the, the entire economy is balance sheet constrained. And here is Kirigan saying, this doesn't make any sense. 
The reason being, where there are debtors, there must be creditors, so there must be somebody who can respond to lower interest rates, even in a balance sheet recession. In other words, like a seesaw. If one person's down, the other person must be up. Okay? So in fact, there's somebody who's suffering means somebody else is benefiting, and therefore they should balance out in the end. And that's their vision. And he continues to labor. He hammers this all the bloody time, which is why I'm quite happy to hammer him back. Um, he's very polite to me as well, as you may, may know. Uh, he says, the overall level of debt makes no difference. It's only the distribution of debt that matters. And the fact that people have got their phones on. Okay. So he said, the level of debt only matters if the distribution matters. You can ignore the aggregate level of debt. Now, they have a model which I can now happily describe as childish of how banks actually operate. It's called banks as intermediaries. You heard the idea of financial intermediaries? That word? Get it out of your vocabulary. They're money creators. Okay? It's bullshit to say they intermediate. Some of them do. There are some intermediation facilities there. There are some people who have large amounts of money that want to park somewhere else and get a, a what they call an arbitrage gain on the money. But 90% of it is created by banks. And I'll show you the, the, um, the mechanics. This is another paper by Krugman, which was why he was having a go at me at the same time. Um, where they model the bank as being a, a single agent who acts between two other agents, gets them together and charges the fee. And he says, let's consider the bank as the life of a single loan contract, which in their model lasted one year. This is the dreadful stuff they think is advanced economics. Okay, it's, it's, it's pathetically <coughs> primitive mathematics. Um, and fortunately, not only is the mathematics being called out, central banks not, I might add, the Reserve Bank of Australia, but real central banks that actually have some decent economists inside them, uh, they are starting to call this out as nonsense now. And the first was the Bank of England. And what they point out, and I can explain this to anybody who wants to see why later, all the models you teach in economics about, about how money is created, the money multiplier model, fractional reserve banking, they're nonsense. There is there are sensible a model of how the financial system works, as Tom is vision of the solar system is how the solar system works. If you believe the sun orbits the earth, you also can believe this model. Okay? Now we've, we've learned to throw away that e the e vision of astronomy. Justified. You look up in the sky and you see the sun goes past every day, rises in the east, sets in the west. Okay? That's the obvious deduction, that it's rotating around us. But it took astronomers to learn the right other way that that's not the case for us to get to the stage where anybody believes that belongs to the flat earth society which is no longer a majority of the population. So here's the Bank of England, which came out in 2014, saying, rather than banks receiving deposits and lending them out, bank lending creates deposits. Now, of all, I, could have, I, was, I, I knew the people in the Bank of England who wrote that paper, and I was aware that they, they were conscious of this, but I knew they, did, they, they couldn't come out and say it. Well, when I was absolutely delighted when they came out, and I thanked them very much for writing the paper. But blow me down when the Bundesbank does the same thing. Now, I'm normally a critic of the Bundesbank as being the arch-believer in austerity, but I couldn't believe this came out here. They say, refutes a popular misconception that banks simply act as intermediaries. Now, most popular misconceptions are things that uh, lay people believe that experts know is false. The weird thing about <laughs> economics, this is something the experts believe which is false. Okay? And that's the struggle we've got right now. That's why it's so hard to shift the politicians, because the people they talk to that they think are experts believe something which is bullshit. Bank of Norway also came out. The bank does not transfer money from someone else's account or from a vault full of money. The money lent to you is created by the bank itself out of nothing. Now in the past, if I was giving a talk like this a mere three years ago, I'd have to quote a whole range of non-orthodox economists you would never have heard of. Basil Moore, Augusto Graziani, etc., etc. Now I can quote the Bank of England and the Wonders mm -hmm. Bank. And this, the reason the central banks are waking up first is they used to couch out of the academic departments and they regard themselves as building on what the academics constructed. They did that, massively elaborate models which completely failed them and they were the ones in the firing line where the politicians said, you told us this was going to be a great year and look how we got screwed. Okay? So the Bank of England, even the Bundesbank, the Bank of Norway, they've woken up to it. It still hasn't happened in Australia. I still think they've... Reserve Bank of Australia is the most ignorant central bank on the planet until I find another one that's even worse than them, but certainly the most ignorant that I've had experience with. So why do they think I can ignore them? Well, this is the model. What I've done here is I've taken the model of, um, of banking that they believe 
and I'll put it into my software package I call Minsky. And what this has is banks in, in this model are simply a acting as, as the theory tells them as intermediaries. So the bank arranges the loan between the consumer sector and the investment sector and then charges the consumer sector a fee for arranging the loan. And what I've got is a capacity using this program to vary the rate at which lending and repayment occurs. A smaller number for repayment or lending means things happen faster. So seven is doubling debt every seven years. Nine is halving debt every nine years in terms of <coughs> repayment and spending. And if I run the model, what I get is increasing level of debt, as you can see, and the uh, amount of debt there. Debt's risen, no change in the money supply, zero growth, and GDP flatlining at 200. Now, if I get in here and I say, well, let's, let's have a faster lending, you won't notice it, but the rate of growth actually slowed down. Notice the debt ratio has risen. And if I then have slower repayments, so rather than people halving debt every um, nine years, it takes 30 years to halve it, you get a rising level of private debt, rising debt ratio, no change in the money supply, bugger all happens on GDP. Okay? Now I can go back in the reverse direction and I can say, well, let's have really fast repayment and really slow lending. And now you've got a trivial debt to GDP ratio, all these dramatic changes in the amount of debt being offered, and absolutely nothing is happening in the real economy. So a gigantic change in the debt to GDP ratio from under, under, under half to over two times GDP, blips in the growth rate, but overall nothing has happened. And this simulation has been running for 868 years. Okay? It's a fair while. In other words, if their model was right, you could completely ignore the banking sector. And that's the sort of thinking they have. But what I can do with Minsky, and this is the reason I designed the program in the first place, is I can come inside and say, well, this is a myth. This is, this is looking, at the, looking at the banking sector, or the, the, looking at the, the financial sector from the point of view of the consumer goods sector. That's one doing the lending. So they have a consumer deposit account, which is one of the assets they have at the bank. And the debt is an asset they have, because that's what the investing sector owes to them. And then all the transfer, this is lending money, which goes across, which, uh, is a, is a transfer that increases, it decreases the amount of money in their, in their deposit account because they've got to lend out of their deposit account, but it increases the debt and the reason that you're doing it is to get interest income. And if the debt gets repaid, that reduces the debt, increases the amount in the consumer sector to, which they can spend. So that's the sort of vision that, that, that Krugman had before that means you can forget about it. But I can say, well, this is a myth. That's not what banks do. Uh, they're not immediate, they actually create. So I can delete the debt which I'll just do, I'll show you first what I'm doing. Click on that button there and that deletes the debt from the system. But not completely because it's, I've deleted it as an asset of the consumer sector. It's still a liability of the investment sector. So Minsky still knows there's debt recorded in the system somewhere as a liability, but it hasn't been allocated to somebody as an asset. So I'll just go through and delete the lending and debt repayment and interest payment and bank fee operations in that table as well and go across to the banking sector's view of the economy and what I can do is say, well, that, that consumer sector deposit, oh, that's, that's yeah, the banking sector there, um, that is actually, ah, I've got a, a bug in this particular version of the program, I hope it still works here, but I'm going to create this as an extra asset for the banking sector. I've realised I've got to fix this particular model. Still, to the to what I want to want to demonstrate. But I'll just need to do a bit of fixing up here. Pardon me, I'm not quite certain why that happened. This is the sort of thing one needs to uh, get fixed by getting computer programmers to write code for you. And one reason I raised money for Minsky was to uh, improve things like this. We haven't quite got around to fixing up how the tables are designed. But I just all I've done is say the debt is an asset of the banking sector and the money is owed, the money payments are made by the investment sector. Okay, here we go. So I'm now going to go back to the initial situation I had, where lending doubled debt every seven years. So all I've done <coughs> is change who owns the debt. Is it somebody, a non-bank, or is it the banking sector? Notice what you get. First of all, you've got a positive rate of growth coming out of that. 
increasing debt, which is happening down here, increases the money supply. And if I now go and increase how fast lending occurs, so lending happens more rapidly, you get a boom. And slow down repayment, you get another boom. And then if you have people repaying more rapidly and banks lending more slowly, you get a slump. Now that's all it takes to flip from one view of the world to the other. And they try to say it doesn't matter, particularly Krugman, who hammers this all the f bloody time. I almost got really French in my life. <laughs> um, but this, this, what they're getting us to be unable to see is what I've just shown you right now. The fact that banks create money matters, really matters, and that's what's drive the overall performance of the economy. So once I've done all those changes and have them as originators, that's the sort of change you get out of the system. And that's why this matters. It's why the sort of research I'm doing and a range of other non-orthodox economists are doing matters, and we don't get any funding for it. There's some coming our way from the, um, from the English government, I might say, which is a bit welcome change, but generally speaking, we do this on the smell of an oily rag, uh, whereas the, these guys get paid enormous amounts of money to work at Harvard and, and Princeton and so on and get paid a fortune. Now, what I've done as well as show, with, again, with working with my Minsky model, is that capitalism is a cyclical system. If you work from the simple definitions of the economy, saying that there's debt, <coughs> workers' share of income, which is part of uh, distribution of income, employment, put them together, you get a cyclical model. If you add to that that there's debt as well, you get a model that has things like this happening. And this is why I saw the crisis coming. It's why I was aware there was going to be one from as long ago as 1992, because I first built this model in 1992. And to illustrate that one, if I bring this up, this is a present part of a presentation I gave to some mathematical economists, so I'm, I wouldn't try to take you through the, the logic of it. It's actually quite a simple model. But if I have a low level of desire to invest by capitalists, which is not what you'd want, you want them to have a high desire to invest, then you get a model that cycles to equilibrium. Now again, this is more sophisticated than any of their models because it's non-equilibrium. Uh, in time, etc., etc., but it does what they think the economy does, it reaches an equilibrium. And what they did during the period from 1992 to 2007 was they effectively projected forward this decline in volatility of employment. And they thought that's the future, we've got to reach the great moderation, we're approaching equilibrium, even though the model didn't show things in the dynamic fashion I'm showing you here. They thought, great, we've solved the economic problem, everything's wonderful. And this was the state of mind, as I know from talking to them, and of a lot of professional economists and central banks as well. Well, that's what they thought was the entire possible range of the system. But if I make capitalists more willing to invest here and therefore more likely to borrow money, this is what I saw with a more complicated model back in 1992. And it looks like it's reaching equilibrium, only it doesn't. It finally has a complete breakdown. I can make it more sophisticated than that with having nonlinear uh, uh, decisions people changing how they behave depending upon the circumstances. This is just people behaving exactly in the same way, a very linear behaviour rather than non-linear. But this is what I gave me the warning the crisis is going to happen. So that's the world we actually live in. But they pretend we live in one where credit doesn't matter. Now, another set of reasons why it matters is that one of the reasons a lot of my own non-orthodox economists took a while to get their heads around this, and I took a while to explain it logically as well, is there's one of the rules of a macro economy, expenditure is income. What you spend becomes income for somebody else. Okay? So it's also a possibility of saying, well, if expenditure is income, then how does credit play a role? Okay? But it's actually quite simple, because you've got two sources you can spend money from. You can spend money from your own pocket, or you can use a credit card. Now, using the, the, the um, loanable funds model that the mainstream uses, you, your credit card increase when somebody else's bank account falls, and therefore they cancel out and you can ignore them. Re using what, I, what, what my own group of economists would call endogenous money, but that means nothing to anybody. So I'm renaming it Bank Originated Money and Debt, otherwise known as bond. Okay. Uh, in a bond world, when you take out credit, you don't have anybody else's money falling. You create additional demand. And for this reason, what we think we can do at the individual level is a fallacy at the aggregate level. People think the government should save money. And their vision is, you save money, then I can save money. That's what, when this, this is where it really does become a seesaw. You can be up, so I can be up at the same time. Okay? 
Now, this is, you've got to know when these particular rules apply. And the economists have got it precisely the wrong way around. So when you have savings, if an individual saves, that actually reduces income at the aggregate level, whether that individual is you, BHP, or the government. I want to illustrate that with a simple little example. Because, this, because of these two sources of expenditure, I'm ignoring at the moment government money creation, but I can bring that in later. You can spend with the turnover of money you currently have, or you can spend with credit. And when you, when you spend from credit, that creates new debt at the same time as it creates new money. And you can roughly measure this by adding together GDP plus credit. There's a bit of overlap because most of credit these days is used to buy assets rather than goods and services. But, you know, a proportion is credit card purchases. You do buy a SMEG oven for your new house, etc., etc., or even your old house. So there is credit-based purchases of real goods and services. But because given so much of it goes into the asset markets now, it's fairly accurate to add the two together. And what you then see is when there's an expansion of credit, of debt, which I define credit as a change in debt over a year. So debt is one thing, that's a measure of how much you owe at a particular point in time. Credit is the change in debt over a year. If it's positive, that'll add to demand. If it's negative, it'll subtract from demand. Now, if you leave those out of your model, you're leaving out the, the major determinants of what happens in the economy because your credit card changes a damn sight faster than your income does. Okay? The volatility of that side is far greater, even if the amount of money is less. So what we're ignoring is the major changing feature in the, in the economy. It's like saying the back wheel's got all the power and I can ignore what the front wheels are doing. Great, enjoy your ride over the edge of the cliff. So you can get what looks like prosperity before a crisis, but then it becomes a crash afterwards. This is what I'm doing on this chart. I'm taking the, the red line is uh, GDP, the blue line is GDP plus credit in America, and they're both graphed on the left-hand axis in millions of billions of dollars. But the, the black line is credit as a percentage of GDP, and that's measured on the right-hand axis. And that peaked at about 15% of GDP when the GFC hit, and then plunged to minus 5%. Then it turned around. That's why the American economy has apparently recovered. But that's why it also had a crisis. That has not happened since the Great Depression for America. And we managed to avoid it in Australia by borrowing the shit out of ourselves for the first time owner's grant. So here's Australia. Now you notice back in 1990, we had the recession we had to have. Why do we have to have it? Because credit collapsed. I think Paul Keating might actually understand that these days. Uh, he certainly didn't back then. But we got through the crisis by not going through the negative point. We managed to stay that far above negative credit. And then we had a boom driven, first of all, oh, this is a little question, which, country, which state do you think first recovered from the crisis? Which, country, which state in Australia first got back to the same level of unemployment it had prior to the crisis. Any guesses? Huh? Western Australia. Pardon? Western Australia. Western Australia. New South Wales. New South Wales. Victoria. 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 Yeah. Okay, let's get a show. Who goes for Western Australia? Okay, who goes for New South Wales? Who goes for Victoria? You win! <laughs> you know why? Because as well as getting $21,000 from the government for a new house, the federal government, Victoria topped up with another 14000 for purchases outside the Melbourne CBD, virtually. So they gave $35,000 per home buy at the time when house prices were about maybe 10 times that. So you didn't need to deposit to get back into the market. Well, what did that do? Okay. That's what flooded the house market. And then after that, China took over. So West Australia was actually the last one to recover because it wasn't until the <coughs> Chinese boom began that caused the cash flow that for the existing and then the new mines in West Australia that they boomed ahead. But literally, Victoria is the first to recover and the biggest level of recovery was in the profession of real estate agents. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. So you have a crisis when the level of debt stops growing and it's already high. It, it won't happen at a low level of debt because the change in debt, even though it can be substantial, is trivial compared to the level of GDP itself. So I, I define aggregate de demand as being the turnover of existing money, which is roughly the same as GDP, plus credit. And I'll give you an example. Imagine you've got an economy of a trillion dollars a year of GDP, which is growing at 10% per year. Nominal. That's a fairly realistic set of numbers. And private debt's initially 50% of GDP, which is $500 billion. Half a year's GDP. 
and it's growing at 20% a year. Now, again, these are quite realistic figures as, as a range for what was happening back in the 50s and 60s. So credit that year will be 20% of outstanding debt. So 20% of 500 billion is 100 billion. So your total demand will be the sum of the two 1.1 trillion. Okay. Now, what happens if next year you have the turnover of existing money again grows by 10%? I'm not discussing the mechanism here, it just happens. So you've now got 1.1 trillion in turnover of existing money, GDP. Growth of credit, growth of debt slows down to 10% per year and you've got 600 billion, 10% of 600 billion is 60 billion million dollars. You add that in, you get total amount of 1.16 trillion. So that's 60 billion higher than the previous year. It's not as much higher as it would have been if that had continued growing, but it's still positive, okay? So you don't have a crisis. But if you get forward to where there's high debt, say like 20% of GDP, 200% of GDP, and that is below the level Australia currently has, below the level of China, below the level of Norway, Belgium, Sweden, about 18 countries that I know of have got a private debt ratio exceeding 200% of GDP. Same old story, debt's growing 20%. Well, 20% of two trillion is $400 billion. So you add those two figures together and you've got a booming economy. This is why it looks good initially. Okay? Remember the previous example, that the economy is only 1.1 uh, was uh, 1.16 trillion. This is 1.4 trillion in the first year. Now next year, growth of existing money is exactly the same, 1.1 trillion. Your growth of debt slows to 10% per annum. Well, your debt's now 2.4 trillion. 10% of that is 240 billion. You add that to the 1.1 trillion of GDP, your total is 1.34 trillion. That's 60 billion less than the year before. So you don't even have to have debt go negative or change in debt go negative. Simply slowing down can cause a crisis. Because aggregate demand for everything, not just goods and services, but also assets, is less than the year before. Just because the rate of growth of debt has slowed down. So simply stabilising the debt level does not mean you avoid a crisis. But this sort of thinking is what I know is inside the brains... Well, I'm being a bit hypothetical there, but the brain's inside the RBA. So both the level of private debt and the rate of growth matter. And with that rough idea of the two being added together, you get a rough guide to what's going to happen. And that's what you have to have in your heads to understand you know, what sort of faces are showing in the future. Now, I know that this, again, in, in politics, if you ask a politician, what should the government do? The answer would be run about budget surplus. Okay? If you get, you get bashed, you talk about a deficit. And I can understand why people believe that, because what you're doing is extrapolating your individual search situation forward. You're saying, if I save money, I've got more money for a rainy day. And that's true. Okay? What happens collectively? Okay. Well, let's take a look at it. I'm going to invent a little world called Tom Dick Harrier. You know, the idea of any, any old Tom Dick and Harry can understand this. Well, let's go Tom Dick and Harry are three staunch Republicans. And they take a look at the data. They're empirically riven. And they, uh, they're not always bright on their own, but they, they collect and work anything out. Uh, and they take a look at the data and say, look, the politicians are never going to achieve that surplus. Because this is the... 120 years of America's budget deficit, budget surplus, pardon me. Now, when you're taking an evidence-based view, that might, have, might have to take a look at a couple of points. For example, here's the 1920s. All the way through the 1920s, the government ran a surplus, about 1% of GDP on average. Fabulous. Saving for a rainy day? Well, the rainy day arrived. It's called the Great Depression. Okay. Is there any causal link? Over here, Clinton surpluses, fantastic. We go and invade, or they go and invade, or we go and invade right with them, of course. Uh, but that causes a bit of a deficit. Uh, so it didn't actually maintain there. But after that, the global financial crisis. But that's a bit too deep for Tom, Dick and Harry right now, so I want to show you what they actually do. They form their own little country, and they each start with $100. So the total money supply is $300. And they spend $100 per year on each other. So the turnover of money, money turns over twice a year, which is roughly the sort of figure we used to see in the 50s, 60s and 70s, actually higher than that. So what I've got Tom, Dick and Harry doing is Tom spends 200 which goes 100 on Dick and 100 on Harry. Dick does the same on Tom and Harry, yada, yada, yada. Well, the total spending is $600 and the total income is also 600 Now, that's the point you can't see if you think about yourself in isolation. Now, what's total savings? Well, Tom's spending 200 he's earning 200 his savings is zero, and the same for the other two. 
as aggregate expenditure, it's exactly equal to aggregate income. It is not roughly the same. It is precisely the same because expenditure is income. Okay? And the savings are zero. Now, of course, they've set the ob objective of, of saving money. They don't want to run a surplus. So the first one into it is going to be Tom. And Tom decides to run for a budget surplus of 5% of his GDP. Now, 5% of 200 is $10. So what does he do? Well, he spends five dollars less on each of Dick and Harry. And yay, he achieves his surplus. But look what happens as well. He's got a surplus of 10. The aggregate GDP has fallen by 10. That sum is now 590. So his individual decision to save has reduced GDP by precisely as much as he saved. What's happened to Dick and Harry? Well, they've actually now got a deficit. They didn't, they didn't plan to run this. It's because of what the other party did in the economy. They don't know that yet, by the way. They're slow learners. A bit like politicians. Um, actually, a bit like economists. Uh, so that's, that's the situation to begin with. Well, Dick and Harry think we've got to restore a balance. So we actually ran a $5 deficit last year. Let's save, let's spend $5 less this year. That should fix things up. So they cut spending by $5 a year, which means they're now spending 97.5 on the other two, each of them. So rather than spending 200, they're spending 195, 97.5 on Tom, 97.5 on Harry. And it's a bit better, but they're still running a deficit because what one did affected what the other one got. And overall, Tom is now finding his objective of getting zero savings is gone. He's now, he gone from 10, he's gone from 10 to five. Nobody's happy at the moment. Okay. Aggregate GDP has now fallen by another $10. You're going backwards. And there's all three are failing to meet their savings target. And aggregate savings, notice what they are? They're zero. Okay. In other words, you can't save at the aggregate level. It's impossible. I want to ban the word from macroeconomics. So Tom says, well, that's no good. I'm going to, I'm going to um, uh, go even further. I'm going to cut another 10. And Dick and Harry think, well, the five didn't work well. Let's try the five again. Well, that's really worked out well. He's got his surplus back. He's back to $10 again. The other two are back to the deficits they were trying to avoid. GDP is now 560 Another $20 fall on GDP. Aggregate savings is still zero. Now, finally, Dick and Harry think, we've had enough of this. We're going to, if we're having a deficit of five, let's, let's cut by 10. Let's do some real austerity here. What happens? Well, they finally get back to equilibrium again. They're each now spending $180 on each other each earning 90 from each other. Income is equal to expenditure again, as all as always is, but individually as well as collectively. Tom doesn't have a surplus, and aggregate GDP is now 10% lower than it was before they started the whole game. Okay? That's what happens when you run austerity. Now, please, take this around and show it to your friends. It's not hard, okay? It's a simple illustration. We need something like this, otherwise people are gonna keep on telling you, look, we must be the centre of the universe because the sun goes from the west, the east to the west every day. Okay? It's the same thing. You've got to think at a collective level before you understand this. And economists don't do it. They do not think in monetary terms. This is the bizarre thing. People like myself who work strictly in monetary modelling are the minority in economics. Most of them pretend the monetary system doesn't exist. We live in a world of barter, a bit like the Cro-Magnons out there without the same level of invention. So that's the world they think in. And with that reasoning, they can't even see what I'm showing you here. And they'd ignore it. They'd tell me I've, got, I've suffered from money illusion. No, this actually drives the actual economy. Now, because the end, if you actually keep that up, you get to zero. And that's the direction that Greece is heading in, thanks to the European Union. So individuals save. Economies and unions of economies cannot save. Just get the word out of, out of macroeconomic thinking. It's household budgeting, it's not running a macro economy. If you want to increase the amount of money, if you want to all have more money in your accounts one year after now, then you've got to say, well, who produces money? How do you make money? Literally, I don't mean make a profit or earn a wage, I mean print the stuff. Now there's two sources domestically you can do that. Banks do it by, create, by spent, creating more debt than they get repaid every year. Uh, and that's why I call it bank originated money and debt. Okay, you get bombed. Okay. You get the money, but you get the debt as well. There's no change in your net assets. Okay. Well, that's very important. It's badly expressed by some modern monetary theorists, so I'm going to change the expression here. But 
the reality is if you want to rely upon the banks to give you the extra money, it doesn't create extra equity. You get an increase in your assets, which is the money in your account you borrowed from the bank. You get an identical increase in your liabilities to the bank. Your net position hasn't changed. And that could be pretty dangerous at some point in the future. Now, governments create money by spending more than they get back in taxation. It's complicated in terms of the mechanisms we're put in the way to stop that happening. But fundamentally, governments can create money by spending more than they get back in taxes. And what taxation really is, is a way of taking out of existence money the governments created previously because if they left it in existence, would have runaway inflation. People are going to ask me, why don't they cause inflation? Well, yes, that's why they tax. Not because you need the tax to spend. And this mechanism, which we should just, we should really actually, should actually ask a question in Parliament, get a politician from some party that's willing to ask an intelligent question, and that's rather hard to imagine that that might be. Uh, but get them to ask, what is the actual mechanism of government financing, step by step? So the procedure in most countries goes as follows. The government works out a budget which has estimates of future spending and future taxation. If there's a gap between the two, they issue, the Budget Act includes authority to issue bonds to the gap. Let's say the gap is 5% of GDP. And let's say it's a trillion dollars. So say it could be $50 billion worth of bonds they issue. When the Budget Act is passed, because the government effectively owns the central bank, as soon as the Budget Act is passed, it's regarded as having that money in its account and it can spend. Now, if you or I had a deficit, if we were expected to spend more than we we're going to earn next year, and we issued bonds to finance ourselves, we couldn't, as soon as we decide to issue the bonds, start spending the money. Okay? We've got to get the money. We've got to sell those bonds. Otherwise, we're, we're a cactus. Now, that doesn't apply to the government. As soon as it wants to do that, the central bank will recognise any cheque that it draws on its the Treasury's account of the central bank as valid. So you get money in your bank account, courtesy of that. Now, the central bank then sells the bonds. Normally, they're 100% or more subscribed because financial institutions want what they regard as safe assets in their portfolio. But in, the, in that case, what actually happens when, when that happens is the government, the, when, the government when the central bank sells those, sells those bonds to the financial sector and the government then spends the money represented by those bonds on welfare and infrastructure and so on, we're transferring money from the financial sector to the real economy. Now, if you're in a surplus, you're doing the opposite. Do you think the finance sector needs more money? That's not like a good idea to you? But that's what a surplus actually does. Okay. Now, the other way you can make a surplus is by having more exports and imports. And Australia's done wonderfully well on that front. What is current, current deficits? Only about 1% of GDP right now, isn't it? It's down a bit. It's normally between 5, 5 or 6%. So countries that run a trade surplus are effectively converting foreign money into domestic money outsourcing the money creation and doing very nicely out of it, thanks very much. That's what mercantilism actually does. So the only sustainable basis for a government running a surplus, which is what Germany is doing right now, and I think though Norway as well, the only basis for that is a mercantilist trade policy. You export more than you import, you have a current account surplus, you can therefore have a deficit, you can therefore have a government running a surplus as well, and the private sector can even run a surplus. And Germany is actually doing all three. Government debt's falling, private debt's falling, because they're running a trade surplus of about 10% of GDP. Now, we're doing anything act, we're actually being a victim of mercantilism rather than a practitioner. So I want to now just elaborate a bit on the argument I've given you beforehand. I'm trying, that little table I dreamt up about uh, six months ago, I'm now trying to find ways of, of making it a more general way for analysing capitalism. And if I get finance for Minsky, then I'll put it into Minsky as well, but just imagine they've got a bank inside there. So you've now I've added a bank with equity and assets over here, and what happens is Tom is borrowing B dollars from the bank, which is increasing the bank's assets and his liabilities, and he's got to pay interest to the bank as well. I haven't included the bank spending in the system as yet, but what you've got is when, when Tom borrows that money, he then spends it on Harry, so Harry gets a nice old bonus. And Harry reckons the economy is doing really well because his liabilities have fallen by the amount of money that Tom borrowed to spend on him. Okay. And this is the sort of distributional stuff you'll see happening as well. Now, if you had a government, well, is it the, the point of that previous slide to some extent was that there's no change in the overall assets and liabilities of the 
of the real economy. Because what Tom's gone, gone up in the liabilities by B, because he owes the bank B dollars, Harry's gone down because that's where Tom spent the money. So in the aggregate, the private sector's uh, situation hasn't changed. Okay. I've got to work on that a bit. I'm still not confident about that little one. I'll get there. But government spending creates, uh, if the government spends more than it gets back in taxes, it creates assets without creating liabilities. As much as you have justifiably complained about the dole, etc., etc., when the government pays the dole, it doesn't come with a bill saying you owe us the money back. Okay? So the, per the recipient gets the money without getting the liability. Well, that's the difference between government money creation and private money, private bank money creation. Now what that means is when the government does that, your assets rise but your liabilities don't rise by the same amount. You get a net increase in your assets. And in general, in a capitalist economy, it's really a good idea to have positive assets. Because in the aggregate, if you don't have a government, the sum of all assets and liabilities is zero. Now, for a bank to operate, a bank has to have positive equity. If a, bank, if a bank's assets don't exceed its liabilities, or even worse, if its liabilities exceed its assets, it is bankrupt. So if the banking sector is going to have positive assets, we've all got to have negative in the aggregate, unless the government creates money. And what we've got instead is a government obsessing on destroying money and getting us back to zero, or even negative assets, collectively. That's why this stuff matters. It's not academic only, okay? This is why the suffering... This, Martin? Sorry. Marcus. Martin? Marcus. Uh, Mar as Marcus said earlier, this is why the suffering is occurring. This is why you lose the argument all the time. Okay? If you don't start here, you're going to lose the argument because they're going to say, where's the money going to come from? Bang. End of discussion. You've lost the argument. Anybody see Theresa May's performance in question time? Talking to a, a nurse who was talking about having to go to a food bank and she says, well, there isn't a magic money tree. There are two magic money trees. There are three if you run a trade surplus. Okay? It's a question of how you use them. So, again, bringing the government inside here, if you imagine what the government, the government gives you a tax liability, so you've got to pay more money out in tax to the government. But when there's government spending to you, that ends up as an increase in your assets. Okay? So rather than the government spending being a negative for the entire economy, it's a positive because it's creating those net assets, which it has the capacity to do because it's the government. Don't do it, we get stuffed up completely. So it's the only body that owns its own bank. And that's the little logic I've taken you beforehand. Estimates its spending, issues bonds to cover the difference. As soon as the Act is approved, that's why the Budget Act matters so much, Treasury's got the money, it then spends, the central bank then sells the bonds to the financial sector, that purchase is almost always oversubscribed. Uh, so the money is not actually created by that deficit in this case because it's, what is happening is the money is being transferred from the financial sector to the real economy, which is where you want it to be. Now, open market operations by the central bank buying bonds off the financial sector does create money, but it starts off by creating it normally in the financial sector. I bought some bonds myself uh, back in the 90s. This is speculation on interest rates. Uh, which was successful, but normally private individuals don't buy the bonds. Normally it's financial sectors that do it. And now if the government runs a surplus, so it tries to tax more than it spends, it's transferring money from the real economy to the financial sector. So that's the overall dilemma. Now I want to, I've been obviously saying the case the government should be spending more. Okay? And there is an argument that the government, if the government spends more, then there'll be prosperity etc etc that's true hypothetically but there are limitations and I want to talk about them because your practical freedom to do that depends on how much your industry can expand if you stimulate the demand now there's plenty of room to stimulate demand in the Australian economy right now because we know how high the underemployment rate is the unemployment numbers are a joke these days okay? the population employment to population ratio is still falling while they're recording falling unemployment at the same time but whether you can expand or not depends on how complex your industrial structure is now, if Germany have popped over to this, they have no problem expanding, okay? Because they've got one of the most complicated, sophisticated industrial structures on the planet. They've also got a current account surplus, which Australia doesn't have. Now, if you have a deficit and you increase the government spending, you're going to suck in more imports. But with a floating exchange rate, that can mean your exchange rate plunges and you pay more for imported goods. You have all sorts of dilemmas coming out of that. So it does matter to have a trade surplus, which we don't, or to get balanced budget. So try to, try to enforce balance, 
uh, trade, which we've failed to do abjectly for the last uh, one and a half centuries. What about industrial complexity? Well, this is a nice little, little chart. This, this, there's a brilliant uh, resource called the Atlas of Economic Complexity. You can download the 2008 uh, book for free. You can see the data online. Just search for that and you'll find it straight away. It's not done by economists, so you can trust it. <laughs> okay. And what it does is it ranks countries on how complex their industrial structures are using a very sophisticated algorithm, which is entirely empirical. Now, number one in terms of complexity, not amazing, Japan, Germany, Sweden, Austria, etc. Countries you might expect all the way to and to see Slovenia, which looks a bit strange, but there are reasons as to why that's the case. And high GDPs as well, not the highest in the <coughs> world because oil-rich countries have got some of those positions as well. Okay, where does Australia sit? We're up there with Chile and Zimbabwe. <laughs> That's the complexity of our industrial structure. Now, if we try to expand that industrial structure, we're going to have trouble. Okay? It is not just that you can simply boost the money supply using the government, everything will be hunky-dory. There's a huge reconstruction of industry needed to make Australia viable on that front, which we haven't yet addressed. And the other point about this is, is that I really do recommend taking a good look at this research. This is a graph with the, on the horizontal axis is GDP per head, on the vertical axis is the measure of complexity that these data scientists have developed. Now, down the bottom, Liberia, Maui. And also, it looks like GIN, it might be Ghana, I'm not sure, Mozambique, Ethiopia, okay? Tanzania, not places you, well, they're great places to visit, but you wouldn't want to live in their economy, okay? Up the top, Japan, Deutschland, Switzerland, Austria, Finland, Singapore, USA, okay. Where's Australia? We're down here. Now what they argue is in a dynamic sense as well, being up the top is good, you've already made it, okay. Being above the curve on complexity, but below the curve on GDP, if they could be in that upper left hand corner, that gives you growth potential because complexity drives growth. The higher the level of complexity, the more likely you are to grow the next year. Obviously down the bottom here is poverty. You've got to increase your complexity to have any increase in GDP. And this is shrinkage is likely. Now the countries there, Canada, New Zealand, Greece, Argentina, Australia and Qatar. That's the region we're in. Not a good place to be. But that's where our industrial policy, lack of industrial policy, comparative advantage driven industrial policy, that's where it's got us to. So, the bubble we've been through as well is its world record. Not the biggest actually, China's got the biggest. But our debt bubble is bigger than what happened in America and bigger than what happened in the UK. So the scale of debt we've got ourselves into, and it's private debt, not the public debt. This is the point. Public debt does matter to some extent, but far less than private debt. And we've let this all happen. I think mean, governments have pretended to doing a good job when there's been this huge boost in, in, uh, in private debt, meaning they've got surpluses. This is the correlation of unemployment on one side to credit on the other. You can see they're negatively correlated with each other. Australia's, this, we're having a strange period now where even with rising credit, unemployment's also rising, falling a bit at the moment. But that is a break in the trend. I've got Norway's name there, pardon me, I didn't change the particular title properly. This is Australia's uh, breakdown of private debt versus government debt. And you can see that way back in the 1970s, corporate debt and household debt were much the same. The corporate sector got borrowed itself to the hilt during the Allen Bond days. Then it's basically fluctuated around about the 80% of GDP level because the corporate sector ultimately is borrowing because it expects to make a profit. <coughs> and expects to make a profit on cash flow. So there's a limit to how much it'll borrow. Household sector thought it's going to make money out of rising house prices. And we now have the highest level of household debt in the world for countries running a trade deficit. Our nearest competitor was Ireland. Okay. The only countries running with more household debt than us are Switzerland and Norway. Or Switzerland, actually. Norway's now fallen behind us. And Belgium Switzerland has a huge trade surplus. Belgium was Pardon? I thought Belgium was slightly above us. Belgium's got, Belgium's got a, no, it's actually got a lower level of private debt than we have, household debt. So this is looking at our household debt levels. I haven't got Belgium in there, but you can see 
we pass Norway, Norway's trending down, we're trending up. Uh, that's the USA. This is China. China, most of China's debt is actually corporate debt. And the housing bubble, I mean, I've been calling and saying it's a housing bubble for ages and being abused for it, as you all know. Uh, it's been funny to watch the literature back here in Australia. For a while, there's no bubble. Or maybe it is a bubble, it won't burst, etc., etc. Now it's a bubble, everybody agrees it's a bubble, but it won't burst, yada, yada, yada. Um, what drives rising house prices is rising mortgage credit. So if you look at the change in the change in debt, change in debt is credit, change in change in debt gives how much demand is rising or falling in the market. And this correlation is pretty much the same as I find for any other country. When the mortgage debt is rising faster and faster, you get a boom in house prices. When it's starting to rise more slowly, you get a slump. So Australia's pushed itself right into an absolute corner on this front. The only way to keep house prices continuing to rise is to continue having mortgage debt accelerating. Not just rising, but accelerating. And the days, we're getting closer and closer to the point where they can't pull any more rabbits out of the hat to drag the household sector into debt. Well, even APRA has been uh, tightening yeah. on interest they're finally, rates. But, but they've, what they've put us in a situation of massive level of private debt, where we depended upon credit, and now they're shutting the gate. Too late. Too late, yeah. Now I'm trying to do a reverse. I'm trying to reverse this whole thing. This, this is uh, my little campaign. I'm actually going to become uh, self-employed next year. I don't want to work for universities anymore. They've been destroyed by the same sort of nonsense policies that have destroyed our economy. So I'm going off and getting crowdfunding on Patreon. So I'll hand a little card on that if anybody wants to help me out. Most appreciated. That's my latest book, Can We Avoid Another Financial <coughs> Crisis? I mean, 25,000 words, no maths in it whatsoever. <laughs> Logic behind it, no maths in it. Trying to explain how the hell we got into the situation and what are the ways out. Thank you.